So we'll go to the next speaker, Dr. Wolfgang Schaschinger from Austria. He is president of European Ayurveda Medical Association, URAMA, and board German Ayurveda Association, also the medical director of Maharshi Ayurveda Health Center, Red Austria. He is going to speak about the value of heart rate variability in measuring the effects of Ayurvedic interventions. Full Thank fact. you. I want to start with some humor. <laughs> Among all the science, <clears throat> happiness and humor are very important for health. So it's a joke, and it's a joke, an Ayurvedic joke. Mr. Max and his wife, they die very short time after each other, and St. Peter has their check-in interview together with them, and he assigns them to a beautiful cloud, number 578, and <laughs> It's really beautiful, great villa and pool and garden and servants. And to them it's an upgrading from middle class to very high upper class. And Mrs. Max is really, really happy, joyful, walks around, enjoys everything. And Mr. Max is just, he doesn't react to it. After a few days, Mrs. Max asks her husband, why don't you, why are you so in a bad mood? How, why don't you enjoy all this? Oh, he says, I'm really angry on you and your Ayurveda. If you hadn't done all this, we could have had this 10 years ago. <laughs> so that's about Ayurveda and longevity. Uh, my situation is that I'm in a family practice. I've been practicing for more than 30 years now and having a Panchakarma clinic for 20 two years, and it's an outpatient clinic. And um, uh, I'm mainly in, in very practical activity. Uh, and one thing I wanted to bring here is a, a possibility to measure everyday Ayurvedic interventions with a very beautiful device, and it's on HRV. So these are the main points. Uh, what we want to start with is a little exercise. HRV is heart rate variability, and we all want to experience heart rate variability. And this is what we do all together. Please take your pulse and take a very deep breath in and hold it for a few seconds. And have the attention on your pulse. And then Breathe out slowly and keep your attention on the pulse. Can you tell me what you experience? Is there any, any experience with regard to the speed of your pulse when you breathe in and out? Yes, it gets slower when you breathe out. It gets faster when you breathe in. When you breathe in deeply, it gets faster and when you breathe out, it gets slower. And this is what is measured in the ECG. And there's a, there's a term in medicine, and that's called the respiratory arrhythmia. This means with every breath you take, your heart rhythm changes. And this is a very old finding before the times of ECG. You have here a quote of a Chinese doctor of the third century, and the quote says, if the pulse rhythm stays as regular as the knocking of the rain on the roof, the patient will die within four days. So this means that this arrhythmia is physiological. If it subsides, life is really in danger. And what was found out is that this arrhythmia has very great significance and it can be measured throughout the 24 hours. Where do I have to point? Okay. So, what are the influences on heart rate variability? It's circadian influences, it's the basic rest and activity cycle, it's peripheral circulation and blood pressure, and it's the respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And all this can be recorded, and as we all know, it's the 
fight and flight response activates the sympathetic autonomic nervous system and the relaxation response activates the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. Here we have a few influences on heart rate variability. It's individual psychological aspects, interactive social aspects, work-related aspects, environmental, external aspects. And all this can be computed and made into a three-dimensional picture. And this, it also has these blue and red colors. Uh, that's the heat map that we've already seen with the measurements of Professor Fagan. Um, and this is a 24-hour graph of the heart rate variability. And the way this is done was invented by an Austrian university institute, uh, Institute of Human Research of Medical University of Graz. And they do a lot of research on heart rate variability. And what you can see here is in the, in the lower graph that you have these blue arrows showing down like, uh, like ice and the red arrows showing up like fire. And that's showing the sympathetic activity, the red ones and the blue ones, the parasympathetic activity. And this one shows the circuitry and rhythm. It shows this is day, this is night, and this is day again. So during night, you have the parasympathetic activity in a healthy person. This means deep relaxation during nighttime. So uh, this measurement was developed in University of Graz. And the way it's done, you get a cigarette box with electrodes. And this you wear for 24 hours. It's smaller and lighter than a cell phone. And this records your ECG and it makes 8,000 measurements per second. And it has a 16-bit calculation that's 60,000 calculations per second to calculate the arrhythmia. And this is a very, very uh, precise measurement. And this has a chip in it. And you just insert it in the card reader of your computer. And then uh, you transfer it through the internet to the university uh, computer, and they make this graph that you've seen before. And they have also a 24-hour online service. And one thing that's interesting is that they have uh, preparing a cell phone application for this, uh, for this uh, measurement. So it's important to have uh, a very exact uh, sampling because if it's not exact, this is with unexact, you have just a few dots and estimations. And with exact, you have a lot more uh, pre precision in the measurements and, you, and the interpretation is much more precise. So here is one of the printouts. When you do the measurement, then you get a record from the university. And it's a three-page printout that has all the data in it. And here again, you see this very beautiful circuit here in rhythm. And in this next one, on the left side, you see the uh, maintained circuit here in rhythm with the blood pressure drop during nighttime and the uh, vagus activity during nighttime. And on the right-hand side, you only see the red arrows uh, on, this, on the third line. This means this is a person who just can't relax. And this is one of these persons who already have the knocking of the raindrops very, very regularly. So the adaptation to circadian rhythms, to other rhythms, is very, very reduced. And this is also a sign of disease coming. So it's a very, very good measurement, assessment of many diseases, for example, for risk of burnout, for hypertension, and many other modern ailments. So I did two patients to show you. And one is a patient who received an Amapachana treatment uh, to show you physiological purification, how does it affect the uh, HRV. And one patient was instructed in TM, 
and we just did a measurement during instruction and on day four of checking. So everybody knows what AMA is. I don't have to relate to this one. AMA Pachana in our clinic, we have a very nice package. This is very practical. Um, the patient after consultation gets its package of AMA Pachana for one week. It's, it contains the tablets and the rasam, the powder for the rasam, and the instruction for diet. And uh, doing this brings the patient in a better circuit and rhythm. So the morning preparation purifies the kafastan, the lunch preparation purifies the pittastan, and the evening preparation purifies the vatastan. And this is how uh, the physiology is purified and the biological rhythms are regained. So uh, this is about the meals, light food, hot water, go to bed before 10 p.m. So this is this one patient who did this amapachana. It's a male shift worker, and his diagnosis was burnout with insomnia, indigestion, hyperacidity. He had reduced appetite, loose motions, and he had really uh, intense pitta vritti and agni mandya in his pulse. So he had this amapachana, and we have the measurement before the treatment, and you can see again you have all the red arrows, so it's pure sym sympathetic activity. Only in the last phase of his sleep, he gets some uh, very short phase of parasympathetic activity. And then he did this Amapachana. During Amapachana, he, incre he experienced incre tire increased tiredness, but better sleep and better appetite. And one week after Amapachana, he had an increased depth of sleep, more energy and motivation during day, good appetite and digestive power, and no more pain in the stomach. And here you can see that the sympathetic activity during nighttime was significantly going down. It did not yet develop a good parasympathetic activity. And maybe with two, three more courses of this Amapachana, even this would have been achieved. But here you can see it's a purely physiological treatment, purely on the level of food and, um, uh, and drugs, and it has this profound effect on the autonomic nervous system. Now the next patient, test setup two, is learning transcendental meditation. Uh, most of you know about TM and how it is practiced. It's 20 minutes twice daily. It's verified by the Vedic texts and it includes systematic teaching in seven steps within five days. And it claims immediate results. So this is the text, the Shastra, that justifies this meditation. Yoga is the cessation of the impulses of the mind. And then the observer is established in the self. If not, the mind takes the form of the impulses and the self is overshadowed. So this is Yoga Sutra, verses two to four. So this is how it works. The mind goes into deeper levels of rest and experiences the self, the silence. And what people always feel, meditation is something difficult to attain. Uh, it's difficult to learn and results would be coming after months or years of training. And what we experience in TM is that results are quite immediate. So I had a patient, a lady patient, uh, and she had perimenopausal complaints with heat flashes and insomnia, mild hyperthyreosis, constipation, and had very, really high vata vritti in her pulse. So she signed up for meditation and during her first TM meditation she felt deep relaxation for the first time since weeks or months. This she told me during an interview afterwards. And the experience during TM was much deeper than with other meditations she was learning before. And after her first TM meditation she was refreshed and had a clear mind. So let's see what happens 
You can, you can see also in this one a red, lot of red, so a lot of uh, sympathetic activity. And you see this and this blue lines and these or the blue arrows. And these are the times when she was first instructed in TM and her first meditation at home. So this is really significant. And I, you know, I, I've been a teacher of transcendental meditation for over 40 years. And I've always told people, yes, it's immediate. Results are immediate. But to show it in such a profound way that the uh, autonomic nervous system really changes with the first impulses of the mantra that's given in the personal instruction, it's really touched my heart as a TM teacher. So what was her result after four days of TM? She felt much easier falling asleep, could sleep through every night. Sleep was deeper and more relaxing. She had less heat flashes, no daytime tiredness and less constipation. Feeling of inner purification and well-being. So here we have a purely mental approach, spiritual approach. And so this was day of instruction. And this was on day four. And again, you can see that the that sympathetic activity, the red line, is much lower than it was before. So the sympathetic activity was reduced during the first four days of TM. And you see, you can clearly see these blue lines. This is whenever she meditated. So a very good relaxation effect of TM. And I sent this analysis to the institute at Graz. And one of their um, professors wrote an email to me. He said, dear Dr. Schachen, it's very interesting that your patient could learn the TM technique so quickly. I've read many HRV measurements, but it's very rare that someone can reach deep parasympathetic relaxation during daytime, and this with such a short period of instruction. So this was really impressive. So uh, what is the conclusion? We can use uh, this HRV for testing of uh, overall autonomic variability. Uh, sleep quality testing, biological age is also calculated in this, in this measurement. And it's a good tool for patient education and measurement of before and after any intervention because you can get these beautiful printouts and it's very easy to interpret. It also gives uh, assessment of, of inflammation risk, assessment of burnout, diabetes, hypertension, heart attack and stroke risk. And it could also be a very good tool for research in Ayurveda. Thank you for listening. Uh, I was announced as president of Urama. I just want to make the point that Urama has a booth up there and everybody's warmly invited. Urama is taking care of medical doctors and is involved in establishing Ayurveda in the health services of Europe. So getting medicines licensed, getting doctors licensed and all this. So we are working with other associations in, a, in an association called Eurocam meeting politicians of the European Union. And I think this is a very important work and everybody's warmly invited to, to support this work by becoming a member. And this is the five pillars of vitality that I teach my patients. And this is the end. Thank you. If anybody have any questions. So may I repeat the question uh, of Mrs. Poranik? Um, the question was, don't we move away from Ayurveda when we use these technical devices like HRV measurements? Well, my personal opinion is that it's, it's supplementary. It's not distracting and it's supporting patient education. You can, we do the pulse reading and some patients feel something about the pulse reading and feel some benefit. But here you have a blueprint of change. And this is a reinforcement to the treatment. 
I also do blood tests. I measure the cholesterol of patients before and after treatment, and people are just thrilled. And they feel, oh, it's, re it's really good. I don't only feel good, its measurement shows it is good. And I think this is complementary and not adverse. Um, just want to add to this because I, I completely agree with you, uh, Wolfgang. And um, as from uh, what I feel and what I've also learned from my uh, Ayurvedic teachers is that you can make use of modern uh, diagnostic tools um, uh, in the sense of an extension of our um, sensory uh, uh, senses of, of perception. And um, I think the biggest danger is if we, you know, give away our uh, sensory organs um, uh, at the door and just rely on, um, on Western diagnostic tools in general, also on conventional, but also on Ayurvedic medicine, um, uh, then you know, that's a big problem. But if we use it and if we do our interpretation uh, according to Ayurvedic principles, which you can do if you have an ultrasound and you see something in the ultrasound, um, you can also in do your interpretations according to Ayurvedic principles and not only to conventional principles. So I think it is very useful uh, to make uh, to also make use of uh, modern Westing, uh, Western diagnostics um, from an Ayurvedic eye. I also want to say I really agree with my two boys here on the sides. <laughs> Um, I think we have, we have Western patients, and that gives you a challenge. So that means we heard this morning nice talks about the sattva which we have to ignite in the patient. And one thing is they feel well, that's why they come back. But if you can really show, this is all the thing about the science, but you can really show objectively this is the blood test, this is the heart rate variability, or all these things, they trust more. You can show them the EG things, when, what happens during the meditation. They will trust more. That means they relax. Their parasympathicus goes up, and that's exactly what we want. Thank you. It does not replace Ayurvedic treatment and diagnosis and attention. So we need the one-hour entrance checkup and we can have this HRV in addition to it, but it does not replace any Ayurvedic intervention, both diagnostic and therapeutic.